We'll now examine the theory behind the UV visual absorption spectroscopy. And we'll do so in a way that gets us to where we're going to make use of the theory in today's experiment. So the way uh, UV visible absorption spectroscopy works is you have a light source. The light goes through a slit just to make a beam. That goes through a dispersion device, usually a diffraction grating that acts like a prism where it splits a light up into a, a rainbow. And then in one type of spectrometer, there's a slit here that only allows a certain wavelength of light to come through. And this whole section here is called the monochromator, meaning it's selecting a single wavelength of light, a single color of light. That goes through your sample, and here's the key. The light going into the sample is the intensity of the light entering the sample. And then some of the light gets absorbed, and so the light that makes it out is the intensity uh, past the sample. And that is what is measured by the detector. And so it's comparing these two the light going into the sample and the light going out of the sample, that tells us how much light is being absorbed. So the transmittance uh, is defined as the ratio of the light getting out of the sample to what goes in. It's the fraction of the light that passes through the sample. The percent transmittance is 100 times that, so 100 times the fraction is uh, equal to the percent transmittance. Absorbance is a unit that's been defined as minus the log, the base 10 log of the transmittance. And so therefore it's minus the base 10 log of the light exiting the, the, um, the sample uh, divided by that entering the sample. And the inverse equation of that is that the percent transmittance is 100 times the um, 10 to the minus absorbance. So let's look at some of this uh, and get a feel for, for the magnitude of these. If the sample absorbs no light whatsoever, what happens is I equals I zero. And if that happens, then the transmittance is one and the percent transmittance is 100, 100% of the light gets through. If the absorbance is 0.1, then what that means is that the transmittance, if you go through the math for this, the transmittance is 0.794 and about 79% of the light gets through. So if the absorbance is 0.1, for every 100 photons of light going into the sample, about 79 make it through. If the absorbance is 0.5, then the transmittance is 0.316, and so that means that around 32% of the light gets through. So absorbance of 0.5, about a, the, about a third of the light gets through, and about two-thirds of the light gets absorbed. An absorbance value of 1 means that only 10% of the light gets through. So for every 100 photons going into the sample, only 10 escape and hit the detector. If we jump all the way down to an absorbance value of 2, what we see is that only 1% of the light gets through and hits the detector. And if you go to an absorbance value of 3, only 0.1% of the light gets through and hits the detector. And so because of this, anything above about an, absor an absorption value of 1 has really rather little light hitting the detector, and that makes the detector response not very accurate. So in order to keep your measurements accurate, you generally don't want to go much above one in terms of your absorption measurements. So that's just a practical note to keep in mind when you're looking at UV visible spectrum. If you see a spectra that has a maximum of like 2.5 or something like that, those values are just not, not credible. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is the fact that when we do this experiment, when we do the experiment we just talked about, we're looking at a single wavelength of light. In this case, whatever color that is. That might be green, I'm colorblind. Might be red, might be green. It is what it is. Now what happens is, uh, chemical compounds absorb light over a series of different wavelengths, over a range of wavelengths, over a spectrum of, of wavelengths. And so this is a UV visible absorption spectrum for a, a, a dye, an organic dye, toluidine blue O. And the absorbance is measured on the y-axis and the wavelength is measured on the x-axis. And we see that it absorbs a lot of light between, say, around 550 and 700 nanometers, very little light between 400 and 550, which is why it looks blue. And then it absorbs light throughout much of the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum. And so what happens is, at each particular wavelength, the compound is absorbing a different amount of light. Its absorbance that is the y-axis, differs at different points along the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's look at uh, uh, a couple of examples here that are related to what we're going to be doing today. Here are absorption spectra between 400 and 800 nanometers for cobalt, 
2 plus, copper 2 plus, and nickel 2 plus ions in solution. And notice that the shapes of the absorption spectra are different. And what this means is that these are different colored solutions. So um, the cobalt solution will look kind of bluish purplish, the copper solution is pale blue, and the nickel solution is green. And so what happens is if you have differently shaped spectra, that is, the spectra show different peaks and different troughs and at different wavelengths, that means you have different chemical species. An ancillary thought about that is if you ever see something change color, that means that a chemical change has occurred. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the relationship between absorbance, concentration of, a, of, what, of what your species is in solution, and the path length by which it's measured. So let's define path length before we go any further. What happens is that you have your light source, kind of a light bulb of some sort. It's shining light out. You have your monochromator. I'll just put a big M there. A particular light comes out. That light then goes through your sample and hits your detector. Now you can think about if your sample looks like that, so much light gets absorbed. If your sample is like this, less light will get absorbed because there's less sample to go through. If on the other hand, your sample is like this, then more light is going to get absorbed. So the path length is the distance by which the um, light path passes through your sample. And normally that's one centimeter, but you can get um, cuvette cells that will, that will uh, hold different amounts, which we'll talk about later on. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a quick simulation that compares spectra for different concentrations of different metal ions with different path lengths. And so this is a cobalt 2 plus, and if it's one molar concentration and a path length of, of one centimeter, the spectrum has a um, maximum absorbance of around 0.7. And if we instead make the absorption, the concentration around 0.1, what happens is the spectrum is much lower. It's much, it's not as high. So let's go ahead and make it 0.2. It looks like that. It looks higher. 0.3 looks like that. Now notice that as we make the concentration higher, the absorption at all of the wavelengths goes up by the same, let us say, fraction, the same percentage, but the shape of the peak, the shape of the spectrum does not change. And that's because the chemical compound, the chemical species, is staying the same, but the amount of it there is changing. So what we can see is that as the concentration increases, the absorption increases over all wavelengths and the, and the, and the uh, shape doesn't change. Now let's look at this same compound, but doing it in different cells. This cell is a one centimeter path length cell. If we make the cell half as large, what will happen is the absorption spectrum will look half as tall. And if we make it only 0.1 instead of 0.5, it now absorbs much, much less. And so you can control the degree of absorption both by the concentration of the species and by the path length. If you go and look at a different compound, what then happens is you'll see different shapes. So different shapes mean different chemical species. Now we're going to look at the mathematics between absorbance, concentration, and path length. And this is described by Beer's Law, which says that the absorbance, which is from now on will be capital A, is equal to ABC. A is the molar absorptivity coefficient, which we'll talk about what that is in a moment. B is the path length in centimeters, and C is the concentration, usually in moles per liter. And as we mentioned earlier, the path length is normally one centimeter. Another name for A instead of the absorptivity coefficient is often called the extinction coefficient and is given the Greek letter epsilon. Now the molar absorptivity coefficient is essentially the darkness of a, a solution at a particular wavelength. So something that absorbs a lot of light will have a larger absorptivity coefficient. Something that's relatively pale colored will have a smaller absorptivity coefficient. And so what happens is the absorptivity coefficient is specified for a particular wavelength. And so the absorptivity coefficient, this is our toluidine blue spectrum again, the absorptivity coefficient for toluidine blue here is different than it is here, and it's different than it is here. Each of these spots along the spectrum has its own absorptivity coefficient. 
So an absorptivity coefficient isn't for a compound, it's for a compound at a particular wavelength. And you normally need to define what wavelength. And what people normally do is they normally do it at the peak. And the peak is referred to as lambda max. Lambda is the Greek letter for wavelength. So you take the peak wavelength, which is there, and you define the absorptivity coefficient. So the absorptivity coefficient for this particular compound is 74,000 at its peak of 628 nanometers. Some typical uh, values for what absorptivity coefficients are for metal ions in solution, like if you look at like an iron solution it looks kind of reddish, or if you look at copper solution it looks kind of bluish, is it's pretty small. They're around one to twenty. Those are those are relatively small absorptivity coefficients. Metal dyes, such as things like if you in lab uh, dissolve potassium chromate or potassium permanganate, those are like maybe five thousand, maybe ten thousand. And things that are made explicitly for uh, absorbing lots of light, that is dyes, like the kinds of things you use to blue dyes for blue jeans and the like things for fabrics, those generally have absorptive coefficients over 100,000. And because of Beer's law, if you want to measure the uh, UV visible spectrum of a dye and you don't want to have an absorbance over one, you need to either have a really, really small path length or you need to have dilute solutions. And normally people just use dilute solutions instead of keeping uh, specialty cells around, specialty cuvettes around that have really small path lengths. So normally what, what people do is you do dilutions of solutions until you have an absorption spectrum that is fitting underneath one. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about what we're doing in today's experiment. So here I have um, five spectra uh, for cobalt 2 plus that we are looking at before. And what we do is we measure the spectra for these uh, at, different, at different concentrations. And what we do is we take the peak wavelength, which is the same wavelength each time, and we measure its absorption. So we measure absorption at that wavelength five different times for five different concentration solutions. So we don't even actually need to uh, measure the full spectra each time, but it's good to know that that's what's happening. And then what we're going to do is we're going to make a plot of absorption, absorbance, and on the y-axis, and concentration of, in this case, cobalt 2 plus, but we'll be using nickel. And you make a plot of those. And from that, the slope of that plot equals the absorptivity coefficient. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the slope of the line for the plot for our nickel content compound that we're going to use later on, our nickel salt we're going to use later on, and you determine the absorptivity coefficient. So for today's law, using Beer's law, what we're going to do is we're going to use known solutions, solutions for which we know the concentrations. And so we're going to create solutions of known C, so we're going to know C, and then we're going to know the path length B, because we're going to use cuvettes that are one centimeter, and we're going to measure the absorbance, so we're going to know C, B, and A, and from that we're going to calculate A, and we're going to be doing that for nickel 2 plus at a particular wavelength. Then for the same compound at the same wavelength, for an unknown solution, a solution that we don't know the concentration, we're now going to measure A, we're going to know, we're going to measure the absorbance, we're going to know the absorptivity coefficient, because we found it here, so that A is that A, is that A, we'll know B again, we'll measure A, and then we'll be able to calculate the concentration C. That's how we figure out the concentration of unknown solutions when we uh, are doing this. So that concludes our review or our preview of UV visible theory.